Thank you so much uh, for giving me this opportunity to speak today. Um, uh, indeed, um, this year actually marks the 10th year of collaborative projects with Mario. So exactly 10 years ago, we had the first funded project together. Um, and the last funded project was just finishing end of March this year. Um, so all of these, very fortunately, all, all of these projects turned out to be extremely successful. And, and um, um, so I can, I can look back at the, at the very inspiring and um, productive time. Um, um, so I know Mario now since 15 years, maybe. So I'm possibly the youngest in multiple dimensions, right? Uh, that is able to, that is getting the opportunity to speak today. Youngest in, in age, youngest in the number of years I know Mario. Uh, but still, over the years, we developed not just a passion for, for the same, same research interests, but uh, a friendship that is very deep. And um, um, so uh, for today, obviously, I had to pick a topic that was in the core of our, of our heart, right? And this is vehicular networking. Since uh, we are both working in the field since maybe 15 years now, um, certainly Mario starting that, uh, that much earlier. And um, I tried to bridge a bit um, the scope of vehicular networks to, well, let's say a little more um, futuristic ideas or modern, modern way of thinking in the, in the currently 5G domain, but let's see how that evolves over, over time. So when talking about vehicular networks, right, there, there a lot of things happened in the, in the last years. Um, and um, particularly in the first years related to technologies, communication technologies. And when we're talking about communication technologies, then what we all have around is, um, well, our cars, modern cars, if you go to the next dealer, right, next door, um, all these cars have a lot of communication technologies already now on board, right? It's close to impossible to get a mid-sized car that has no Wi-Fi on board, or getting a mid-sized car that does not have an LTE modem on board. Um, meanwhile, a couple of these cars also getting this um, uh, technology that is called DSRC, dedicated short-range communications, which is in the end something something like Wi-Fi, just for the for the cars, right? Um, if you go to Japan, you can buy them since many years. If you go to the US, you can, you can buy them from General Motors. Um, in Europe, well, Europe started the field of vehicular, I guess, but um, now we are falling short uh, 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 compared to competitors in, in other continents. But still, there's a big question of what is coming next, right? And um, um, you see on the slide, I put technology 2020. 2020 is just next year, right? This is, this is next door. This is not, not long into the future. And still, we have no clear idea. Um, and this is because of many things. Um, this is because of technology barriers that we are still facing. That is a question of market. Uh, and that is a thing of um, when we combine vehicular networks uh, with um, automated driving, that is a question of public acceptance in general. Uh, so there's many, many of these challenges coming up. Getting prepared, right? Getting prepared for this is something we can easily, rather easily do, right? Um, let me replace uh, the technology 2020 simply by adding software-defined radio. So then we can do everything in software, replacing software even down to the physical layer and um, coming up with new devices, right? Uh, coming up with new solutions, uh, maybe working next year, maybe working in five years later, and so on and so forth. Um, and fortunately, there are some other technologies um, gaining interest these days. Uh, we uh, kind of abandoned them uh, many years back in the, in the vehicular scope. That is all these line of sight technologies, right? Line of sight is always complicated in vehicular. Cars moving, moving quickly, moving quickly is a problem, right? Uh, then line of sight is not stable anymore. But because of uh, uh, reliability issues and because of um, um, redundancy, privacy, security issues, these line of sight technologies gain more and more interest these days. Um, and this is visible light and one option, right? Uh, you can imp every new car, right, has LED head and tail lights. LED head and tail lights, you can easily, rather easy from a technology point of view, modulate digital information on top of this light and then you have a very stable, very secure communication channel between following cars. Same thing you can do with using millimeter wave uh, uh, technology. Every car has radar, front radar, back radar. It's just there. It's uh, 77 gigahertz. Uh, you just use the same technology that you use for distance measurements for, for the communications perspective. So this is the, by the, this kind of starting point, And this is the point when there are also um, uh, discussions uh, that I had with Mario over the many years uh, started. How can we use these technologies? What can we do? Which applications can we support? And I could now talk for hours on, 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 on our, our shared interest in, in what applications we could support. I, I'd like to pick a kind of a different angle today, um, uh, uh, looking into what is consumer technology doing these days. So going away for a second at least uh, from what cars and vehicles are doing, 
Um, and if you look at consumer technology, well, you see every year there's a new technology coming up, there's a new Wi-Fi version coming up. Uh, currently, we're all using uh, IEEE 802.11ac and AD for giving us gigabits per second in our home. Uh, we're using um, currently LTE Advanced 5G is on the, on the step uh, to get gigabits per second on the, on the cellular links. And it looks, everything is fine. Everything is good. Everything is solving the problems. Right? And we, uh, there's people, particularly from, com from, from commercial companies, going around uh, selling us the idea, well, uh, there is no research anymore. Right? Uh, this, is, this is done. Um, why, why don't you stop? Um, uh, particularly um, with uh, the technologies now being standardized. Um, just picking one example, right? This one example from a technology is this uh, DSRC, this uh, 802.11p uh, protocol, which is used for the cars. Um, and um, so it's a standard. Many companies happy with the standard. We got dedicated spectrum for this. This is a very valuable resource, right? We got dedicated spectrum for this. And it's not on the road, or essentially not on the road. Um, why that, right? Um, why that? There's a lot of field testing that has been gone on, um, that there was field testing in all continents. Uh, the biggest ones in the US, um, uh, where there was a kind of, kind of decision making close to getting it mandatory into, the, into every new car. Well, then there'll be elections in the US, right? This is a different story now. Um, but um, there are still problems, research problems. And the main research problems is, that are still unanswered, by the way. So there is still things that we have to talk about, and that's mainly related to scalability and real-time capabilities. And that, right, scalability plus real-time capabilities, right? Um, there was a, there's continuously going on these this, this, uh, expert meetings. One of them uh, is a Dutch Stuhl seminar series uh, that, that we organized in, in, in Germany. And of course, Mario was part of that all the time. When he joined these meetings, um, the picture's a little, little, right? So there, you see Mario in the very back, um, usually smiling, um, uh, joining all these contributions with his energy and uh, uh, enthusiasm. And um, uh, in the end, discussing, well, there is still things we may do with this technology, even so there is scalability issues. So what am I talking about? Right, let's, let's have a second look at the, at the, at the consumer market. Right, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi is there. Yes, everybody's using that. 5G is there, close to, right? Uh, it's, oh, the first, first test pads are up, right? Uh, some companies claim they have 5G. It's not really 5G yet, but uh, at least they claim having 5G. Um, the standards are close to there, so we are currently having release 15 um, that is being standardized. Release 16, well, is, is close to, right? Um, there is uh, some, some minor tweaks that we are expecting for, for release 16. So why are, not, are we not jumping, simply jumping to, to everything that is 5G, right? So easy. Technology is there. It's a cool technology, by the way, right? No, no, do not misunderstand me. If you have small cells around using 5G, it's giving you incredible radio resources. Right? It's giving you guarantees. It's, it's awesome, right? It's awesome. The problem is we are still, all of us, the majority of us, at least, is living in a developing countries when it comes to cellular networks. So Italy is not bad. But it's not perfect either. US, in some places, is good. It's marvelous. In some places, it's terrible. Uh, Germany, same situation. Right? In, in my place, in, in Paderborn, in, if, you're, if you're standing in the middle of the city center, you're having perfect LTE coverage, right? Um, excellent data rates. If you're going to my institute, uh, it's going down a bit. If you're going a little further, it's dropping from LTE to 3G to 2G to no service. This is what we are facing. This is really what we are facing. And this is something we need to support. We find solutions to support our cellular networks that in theory bring excellent service, but nobody will have these small cells everywhere in the world. Um, this is just a financial disaster. It would be a financial disaster, right? Um, so let's, let's think about this. How can we get connectivity to the places where there is none, right? So slowly, I'm getting back to the cars. You see this all right? right? So you see it coming, teasering a bit. Um, um, there's one more thing to, to 5G. This is um, not just about uh, providing communication, big data pipes, and so on. Uh, 5G is also coming with this mobile edge computing idea. And this mobile edge, the main idea of this mobile edge computing is getting data and processing as close as possible to the user. Right? Formerly, well, you're all using the cloud every day, right? Um, every day. 
You, whatever processing you need, you drop it to the cloud. Whatever data you want to store, that which you want to have access everywhere, wherever you are, 24 hours a day, you drop it to the cloud, right? But where is the cloud? Right? The cloud is far away. The cloud is honestly far away, right? Um, literally. So it's maybe located in Alaska, in Scandinavia, typically in colder places to get uh, away the heating problems, uh, the cooling problems. Sorry, for the for the for the for the big computer centers. So this is. On average, I don't know, maybe 3,000 miles, 4,000 miles away from you. So you can't bridge speed of light. There's, there's a huge issue. So you need everything to get closer to you somehow, to get low latencies right? for everything, for data, for communications, for computations, for everything. You want to get it close. And this is the idea of mobile edge computing. Now, we already have a problem getting small cells out there. Now we have to have to install in each of these cells substantial compute power. So there's another form of investment that we need to do, right? There is, we need to, the, well, we, we meaning the operators, right? They need to set up small cells. They need to equip each of these small cells with compute power. And then everything, then the world is fine, right? Then everything is, cute, is awesome, right? We can't do it any better. But, right, again, full coverage is the, is the big issue. How do we get to full coverage? not only from the data delivery services, but now also for the mobile edge computing, right? It's just a question mark. I have no solution so far, right, so far. And then we were talking, right? This is actually based on ideas that Mario started and um, we were working together over many years. Um, um, there was um, um, a trend that, that actually Mario, Mario initiated and um, Let's have a look at the, one of the very first publications. Um, I just picked it up from, 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 from EDAS again. And um, right, you see this uh, vehicular cloud. Mario came up with this idea. Um, one of the, of, the, of, the, of the core papers in this domain uh, is just co-authored by Mario, single author paper. Um, I have a fancy new idea. Let's use multiple cars and use these communication capabilities and the computational capabilities in these cars to provide services, to provide cloud services, local cloud services, right? Certainly zero, zero solutions in this paper, but the idea was there, right? Nobody came up with this idea but Mario at this time. So uh, we were working on this. Uh, the, the most recent paper just published this year, so early this year, um, uh, Mario, of course, uh, being part of the co-authors list here. Um, so we, we, we now looked into this in more depth. How can we solve this? What are the tweaks that we need to come up with, right? Doing cloud computing, doing mobile edge computing without the mobile edge, or actually using a really mobile edge. So having an edge that is moving, having an edge that is consisting of cars, using the compute capabilities, the communication capabilities of the cars, right? Um, we, we were working on this, on this, on this idea. Uh, we came up with this, um, what we call the hierarchical vehicular cloud computing architecture. Super complicated name, right? The, in the end, it just tells, let's replace somehow this mobile edge, the original mobile edge, where you have this compute power at the E node Bs in the, in, the, in, the cellular, in the cellular world by compute power that you have in the cars. Right? So what you see is a mobile edge computing um, uh, idea. Right? Um, that could have been a slide by, by any of the, of the big telcos. But now if we add a little, little more functionality in here, we see the cars not only as a user of the service, but also as a service provider itself. Right? And this is the opportunity that is out there. If you look, for example, into modern self-driving cars, if you talk to some of the car makers uh, producing or developing these cars, these cars get incredible compute power these days. Why that? Because you have so many machine learning algorithms running all the time for doing so many decisions, right? Uh, doing, taking a decision, making a right, making a left. This is an easy decision. But taking a decision, how to decelerate, how to accelerate, what are the particular curves here? Right? This is a non-trivial decision anymore. So they have more compute power in a single car than I have in my entire lab. And we have a substantial compute power there, right? So why not making use of this? So how can we do that, right? How can we do that? So we, we thought a little of this, uh, about this problem and well, first, as, as you do, right, maybe can we somehow identify cars, multiple of course, but they are all mobile, they are moving. So there's no stationary infrastructure anymore. Right? Consider you have a car passing by, you give it a computational task, it's moving away. 
fortunately, taking your, taking your task away and you, you will never get it back, right? So you will need access not just to a car, but you will need access to kind of a virtual mobile edge cluster, right? So you need to cluster cars together, providing the this, providing this service, and together providing the service and keeping, maintaining communication to the user, even though the cars are moving, right? Um, so that could be stationary. Stationary not in the sense that the cars are standing still, but stationary in a sense that you provide the service at a certain geolocation, right? For example, uh, on this slide here, right, you see there's an intersection. Why not turning this intersection into a virtual place where you provide this mobile edge computing? Cars are coming, joining this mobile edge server, going, leaving this mobile edge server, and while they are there, they provide all the service, all the resources that they have, right? So, in theory, it sounds very easy. In theory, you just have to identify, okay, you, you have this intersection, there's cars coming, you join them, cars going, you leave them, uh, you maintain this data, you maintain these handovers. Well, um, the devil is always in the, in the small details, right? And there's a lot of small details here. For the time being, right, um, I, I can just say we found solutions for many of these details, right? We found solutions for many of them, and we can make that happen. We can make that happen as it is. Um, there's another scenario where this uh, mobile edge computing also makes a lot of sense. And this other scenario is uh, what we now call a mobile scenario. Still, cars are moving all the time, anyhow. But in, in a mobile scenario in the sense that we are not considering an intersection in an urban environment, but more kind of free-flowing traffic on a, on a motorway, on a highway, whatever. Right? And if you have this free-flowing traffic, still many of these cars moving tend to be in close proximity for a longer period of time. So if they are in close proximity for a li little longer time, and this little longer can be in the order of, I don't know, a few tens of seconds, maybe up to minutes. So it's very, in our perspective, possibly short times. But for the computers, it's ultra long, right? In, for these computers, it's ultra long. You can do so many things in, in 10 seconds. That is, that is very long times for the computer. So if we maintain them in a stable cluster while they are moving on the road, while they are moving on this freeway, we can provide virtual mobile edge computing. And we can provide exactly the, sa exactly the same services that all the big telcos promise us for the 5G network. And we can provide these services wherever there is cars. So we are no longer restricted to situations where there is a telco that is installing eNodeBs and installing small cells and installing mobile edge clusters. We are able to provide a service wherever there is cars. Right? Did you make an observation? Typically, wherever there's cars, there's people. So, kind of a correlation in there. It's an interesting, interesting artifact, right? So, whenever you need mobile edge computing, whenever, let's say, a substantial number of users need mobile edge computing, there's typically cars not far away. So, there's a high correlation between lots of people on the road somewhere and a substantial number of cars being in close proximity so that they are able to provide exactly these services. So we did some feasibility study. And um, so this feasib feasibility study was, um, is based on uh, some, some real mobility pattern. Um, and this mobility pattern we took as an example the city of Luxembourg um, because that is one of the, of the best studied mobility scenarios currently in the vehicular context. So we just used the city of Luxembourg having traffic go and go and go and we observed is there a sufficient number of cars in each of these situations so that they could, in theory at least, run our algorithms, right? So just to make sure that um, it's not just some, some crazy idea of some scientists that, um, I don't know, had a glass of wine too much and uh, uh, in the end, they're not able to get this into, into some real solutions. And I, let me give you some, some, some results here. Um, so this is, this is the... A heat map um, uh, showing exactly this uh, street network of, of Luxembourg. And the heat map, the color coding is the more brighter the color gets, so the more yellow the color gets, the more cars are in very close proximity for different times of a day, right? So if you look at the, let's say, unsuitable time of a day, which um, we don't have a night time, we don't have midnight here, right? Midnight, there's also not that many cars out there. But um, a rather unsuitable time of a day is, uh, uh, is three in the afternoon. For whatever reason, in Luxembourg, people are not on the road in, in, at 3 p.m. In, 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 in the afternoon. But 
at the same time, there's also not many people there who need this mobile edge computing. On the other hand, if you look at, uh, I don't know, rush hour time in the morning, 8 o'clock, or in the afternoon, or in the, in, at noon uh, when, when people go for lunch, there are so many cars out there, they are so yellow in all streets, that we can easily provide these, these mobile edge computing services without any pre-installed hardware. We just use available resources, computational resources, right? communication resources, storage resources that we anyhow have in our cars. So that is what we can do in any, any time of the day. Right? So what we need solving from a, from a, let's say, scientific perspective is all these clustering questions. Right? How do we get these cars together? And um, again, just uh, because there's not much time today for, for, for going into lots of, lots of details, I picked two scenarios um, how we can do that, giving you a rough idea of what, what, what can be done. And um, one, one idea um, uh, focusing on cars that are out there but not moving. This happens from time to time, um, right? This happens actually on average 23 hours a day. There are statistics telling a typical car is parked 23 hours a day. Where are they parked? Typically rather close to the curbside, so there's communication capabilities. And nobody's using the ICT resources of this car anyhow. So currently no self-driving motors, right? So you can use everything that is available. So why not making, making use of this? So we can use these parked cars as kind of a virtual mobile edge server very easily. So uh, in this sense, we have just to turn this uh, parking spot into um, what we call a virtual roadside unit or a virtual mobile edge computer, compute cluster. Uh, in the end, it doesn't matter, right? Um, typical criticism that also Mario got all the time, and I got when, when I was talking about this idea. Oh, come on, this, this, this does not fly, right? This does not fly because cars have very limited energy available when they are being parked. So I'm turning this, this service on, I'm providing services for other users, and when I come back to my car, it doesn't, doesn't, uh, ignition doesn't work anymore. Right? So we did some easy calculations. So you can run all these ICT services without any problems for more than a week until energy resources are getting weak. Honestly, if every car would just provide these resources for an hour or two, to the community as a whole, we would already get marvelous mobile edge services. Right? So it's, it's indeed a non-argument. Um, still, we provide resources to everybody else. And this, again, right, boils down to one question, whether we as a community, now not talking about the scientific community, we as a public accept this. Right? If somebody else is using my resources. But at the same time, I'm allowed to also use the other people's resources. So let's see. I don't know. I have no answer to this question, right? We are, we are focusing on the, on the technical solutions here. Um, if you focus on the, on the moving cars, right, um, I already have this, this one example where uh, you have this intersection. And this is a very interesting thing, right, when you have this intersection. There is, if you look into the literature, right, um, so, so many of the students in the back, um, uh, you, you have heard about this mobile ad hoc networking. I'm pretty sure about this. This is a long, old story. And there were papers on papers on papers on mobile ad hoc routing protocols, mobile ad hoc clustering protocols, many of these. And essentially, long story short, many of that's failed. So we don't have it at, at all today. But maybe we can learn from some of the mistakes from that time. And we can build something, something smarter. And the main problem of these mobile ad hoc networking protocols was that it was a primary assumption that everything must work entirely distributed. There is no central coordination at all. There, there's, there's, there should be nothing that is special in this network. But if we have just a little bit of speciality in this network, maybe we can overcome exactly these limitations. Right? And that is what we, what we suggested in, in, in our solution. We cluster not arbitrarily, but we cluster according to hotspots. And the typical hotspots are then intersections or multiple connected intersections. That is one thing. And we cluster with a little bit of infrastructure support. And this little bit of infrastructure support can even be a very old 2G network. And for this, coverage can be kind of taken as granted. 
right? And then we do, right, in the first stage, uh, we, we uh, identify um, uh, our hotspots, we identify our clustering um, hotspots, we use this uh, access point, we use this enode B or whatever that is for doing just the clustering support, and then we do um, uh, move on with this cluster, having cars using this information, distributing this information, and so, forth, so on and so forth. Right? In the first step, we get, gather all this control data by the means of this access point. Then we assign the cluster roles. Then we distribute the control information. And then we move on just using the mobile edge computing. Right? So, so far, so good. So this, this by the way, um, was the last paper I wrote together with Mario, published this year. Um, very happy that it was published this year. Um, still having had a lot of discussions uh, with Mario also this year. Um, um, uh, visiting him from time to time in, in Los Angeles uh, was still wonderful discussions. Um, um, so let me wrap up a bit. And I, I just need one, one slide that is non-technical for, for this wrapping up. Um, so like Luigi already introduced, right? I, I did a lot of things with Mario that were non-technical. So um, we did some sports. For example, so we did some cycling uh, at Lago Maggiore. Uh, we did some hiking. This one is on Hawaii. Uh, we did some snorkeling. Uh, I forgot actually which place that was. Um, uh, we did actually did not swimming. So actually, did, I forgot the not here, right? Um, uh, but I remember this 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 one time when when I was doing the cycling tour with him at Lago Maggiore. Um, I was terribly done after the cycling tour, and um, so I had to rest a bit. Uh, well, as you know. Mario went swimming in the, in the meantime, and I had my rest. Um, so I enjoyed this time a lot. Um, I really enjoyed this time. Um, and um, uh, essentially, all solutions that we came up with, now switching back to the, to the more technical part, right? For all solutions that we came up with, there's also there's cool, cool things out there. There's still so many tiny spots that we need to work on. And I'm pretty sure we do work on. And um, at the moment, this, um, we already decided the last funder, by the way, from, from, from the last project was uh, Toyota. Um, and uh, we already decided to move on in the same spirit, um, following the legacy of, of Mario in this, in this sense. And uh, there will be lots of additional research challenges, discuss discussions, ch and solutions that we will come up in the next years. And I'm so much looking forward into this. Thank you very much. Thank you.